okay, so so let's let's try to do uh, an analysis, um, you know, of what happened. Why why did Trump win, and why did Trump win so big? And I think I think the I I I, I think the two I think there are three causes, and and I think one of the interesting things, one of the really interesting things that I think everybody has to think about is why he did so big, why he did so well with Hispanics. But we'll get to that. Oh, here's a prediction. I want to make a prediction. I predict. Whoops. Uh, are we still on? Is everything okay? Did the video go away and come back, or is it just me? Okay, looks like it's okay. Uh, here's my prediction. My prediction is that by the middle of February, certainly by the end of February, let's make it the end of February, by the end of February, um, by the end of February, Americans will think the economy is doing great. So when asked how the economy is by the end of February, and particularly Republicans, all the people who said the economy sucks, the economy is awful, the economy is terrible, the economy is horrible, I feel so bad, the future is awful, the present is awful, everything's terrible, everything sucks. By the end of February, as soon as Trump becomes president, the economy will flip and they will all say the economy is fantastic, I've never done better, I'm doing phenomenal, things are great. So I think... Um, the, the perception of how well the economy is, is, is completely political, has very little to do with how the economy actually does. That's just a prediction. You can um, test me on that once we get to February. It might happen even before that. For all we know, just the euphoria of knowing that Trump won will have affected everybody's opinion about the economy already uh, before that. The stock market is soaring today, of course, uh, partially because the uncertainty is over. Whenever uncertainty is over, the market goes up. I would have expected the market to go up even if Harris won. The market's going up more because Trump won, because in certain parts of the economy, let's say banks, banks up like, last time I looked, they were up like 10%. And the big reason for that is Biden was awful for banks. The, the regulatory regime, the people he put at the head of the regulatory agencies were terrible for banks and terrible for bank consolidation. Um, I think right now what's being priced is bank consolidation is back and uh, the regulatory agencies have become much friendlier and much easier to deal with, and therefore valuations have spiked uh, as a consequence. Uh, for the rest of uh, big business, uh, tech and other big businesses, yeah, uh, I, I think they expect this to be very good. Trump has talked about cutting corporate taxes. That would be good for them. Uh, Trump has also talked about uh, giving Elon Musk. I mean, Elon Musk will bring kind of industrial policy into the White House and help Trump pick winners and losers, and I think the big businesses uh, that are in the stock market figure they will be the winners, uh, whether that filters down to small and medium sized businesses. I do not know. I can tell you this, that to the extent that Trump is serious about, you know, uh, um, tariffs on everybody, universal tariffs across the board, uh, to that extent, American businesses are going to suffer as, um, as everybody else is going to suffer, and uh, they are overvalued right now. But you know, yeah, I mean, uh, Trump is probably good for the stock market. I will say that if you look at Trump's stock market performance and you look at other presidents' stock market performance in 2016, it wasn't that much better than other presidents. Uh, stock markets generally go up and uh, over the terms of presidents, and there's almost no correlation between whether a Democrat or Republican wins in terms of the performance of the stock market. So, so be it, right? Uh, as, as I've said many times, J.D. Vance loves Lena Khan, and that could very much be reflected in, um, in, in what happens in the future in terms of antitrust. Um, but who knows what Trump will do? I mean, that's part of the thing. Nobody actually knows what he'll do. But yes, I think some businesses, uh, some big businesses are going to like this because uh, I think Trump is very susceptible to them, to them being nice to Trump. Uh, some big businesses won't like it because antitrust will be sicked on them. And I think the criteria by which antitrust is sicked on a business or not is whether they play ball with Trump or not. So I think what you're going to see is more politicization of business rather than less. Uh, you know, particularly with tariffs, you will see lots of exemptions. If you go back to 2016 and you look at the tariffs, a lot of people got exemptions. And it turned out that the people who got exemptions with the people who gave money to the Republican Party. So I think, as we all know, um, the, the closer 
the, the more government gets involved in the economy, the more corrupt the economy gets in terms of uh, in terms of intervention. Chris says Elon Musk hates Lena Khan. Yeah, and J.D. Vance loves her, and you know Trump will have to decide which side of that he's going to take. I, I would be shocked if Lena Khan doesn't lose her job, but uh, but still, I mean, the fact is, J.D. Vance is going to advocate for appointing somebody who um, uh, who is uh, closer uh, who is closer to uh, to uh, closer to Lena Khan than otherwise. That is, uh, I think, I think Trump Trump's people are very, very, very interested in strong antitrust enforcement. Very. So uh, Elon Musk might not be, but everybody else is, and I don't think Elon will have a lot of influence in Trump can, in Trump with Trump, I, you know, because I, I think ultimately, yeah, I don't think he will. Uh, I, I think there'll be a honeymoon. Uh, he'll he'll do some stuff, and then he'll disappear from the Trump thing. Again, you can test my prediction in uh, a few months and see if that turned out to be true or not. Lena Khan is the head of the FTC. She is the one suing uh, all these companies for antitrust violations, although a lot of the lawsuits were started under Trump. All right, what else did I want to say? Um, so why? Why did he win? I think there are two things that, uh, that uh, uh, explain why he won. Um, maybe three things, two and a half things. Let's say, th- let's say three things. Two that I'm sure of. One is me speculating, and it'll be interesting to see what you guys think. The first, I'm pretty sure of, I've been saying this for years, it's not new, and that is that America is not a left-wing party, not a left-wing country. Uh, As Ayn Rand said, America will never go for communism, America will never go for woke, America will never go for crazy left-wing stuff. It will not go for explicit anti-Americanism, it will not go for explicit love of Hamas, it will not go for uh, defund the police and BLM and, uh, and the rest of the woke agenda. Uh, there was going to be a red wave in 2022 in response to woke. And the only reason there wasn't a red wave in 2022 was because of the abortion issue. The abortion issue is what kept, uh, is what allowed Republic, uh, Democrats to, to win some significant positions in the House and prevent a, a big red wave and prevent the Republicans from taking over the Senate. Well, there are four reasons. I'm going to add another reason in a minute it, w- the, that relates directly to the Senate. So, look, the country's not woke. The country's not egalitarian. The country does not believe in egalitarianism. It is, this country is still a country that believes in, merit, in some form of merit and merit-based compensation and inequality based on uh, performance. And the country celebrates that and embraces that and believes in that. The country is basically patriotic and the country is basically pro-Western and pro-Israel and pro, uh, you know, and pro-Western values. And it does not appreciate young people with kafirs running around uh, major cities and, and hoisting Hamas flags. Uh, nobody likes that. Not, not, uh, and it doesn't matter what ethnic group they belong to. It doesn't matter where they come from, rich, poor, middle class. They just don't like it. They don't like the dissing of America uh, in the way that the left has done. Um, I've always said that I think the right is more of a threat than the left because the left does not resonate with Americans, and therefore the left will not be able to establish the kind of power and control over American life that a dictatorship, let's say, or an authoritarian regime can, uh, uh, can assess. I mean, across the board, uh, whenever woke is up for a vote, Americans reject it. And I think to a large extent, Kamala Harris could not escape from her time in the Senate where she was Elizabeth Warren, way to the left senator. She could not escape her association with the woke. She could not escape her attempt to bring the Arabs in Michigan, uh, in, in Dearborn, Michigan, uh, to her side by dissing Israel and siding with Hamas. She could not escape. Uh, the fact that she was associated with the far left. And, uh, and this country is not that. It is a lot of things, but it is not woke. It is not left. It sometimes rejects the Republicans for a variety of reasons, usually that are justified, but it will not embrace defund the police. It will not embrace BLM. It will not embrace equality of outcome. And that's to the credit of the country. And as a consequence, it, it will not systematically 
and overwhelmingly vote Democratic as long as that is what the Democratic Party is perceived to be. So that's reason one. It's a rejection of egalitarianism, a rejection of the craziness of the left. Uh, and uh, Kamala Harris was not a good enough candidate to be able to distance herself from that perspective. Maybe, maybe somebody like, uh, you know, the governor of Michigan, maybe somebody like the governor of California, although I doubt it. Maybe some other governor in the Democratic Party could have done that. Kamala could not. Uh, and, uh, and partially because she did not come out strongly enough for a centrist position. She didn't come out strongly enough for Israel. She didn't come out strongly enough for, uh, for America. She, she ran away from identity politics. She did a good job there. But she couldn't escape the trap that uh, the far left set for her. And, uh, and this, is, this is a repudiation by the American people of the far left. That's reason number one. The second reason is, and I think, I think the fact that she didn't sh choose Josh Shapiro was a reflection of that. I think choosing Josh Shapiro would have told, would have said, no, I'm a centrist and I'm, I'm, I'm moving to the Senate. Maybe it would have helped her, maybe not. I mean, all, all she needed to do was win Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, and Michigan. We're not talking about a lot of votes here. I mean, in spite of the fact that Trump won, it wouldn't have taken a lot, of, a lot for, for Kamala Harris to win. She, she needed those three states. And uh, with Josh Shapiro, she might have gotten it. I'm not sure she would, but she might have. Um, it, it is the fact that she repudiated, she did not, strongly and vehemently enough repudiate the left. Second, the reality is, and you could see this in all the exit polls, and we know this because you could see that in, in people's attitude generally, the country is dominated by, uh, by fear, by fear, by negativity, by anxiety, uh, and, 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 and by some hatred, but a lot of fear. Fear of immigrants, fear of the Chinese, fear of, uh, I don't know, the Russians, fear of Hamas, f and, and, and of course, fear of elites and, and everybody else. And um, we've talked about this many, many times. Donald Trump not only is brilliant at fueling that fear and encouraging that fear, but he's also brilliant at capitalizing on it. Uh, part of the fear was, was a consequence of the fact that people, inflation is devastating. Inflation is the one thing, we saw that in the 70s and we saw it again now, inflation is the one thing you pay a political price for. And nobody sits around wondering too long who caused the inflation, would a Trump victory in 2020 change the trajectory of inflation. Nobody thinks that. No, nobody, nobody actually does that thinking. Economists might do, but nobody in the public does that. Inflation happened under um, inflation happened under Biden. Inflation in the 70s happened under Jimmy Carter. They're out. That's it. We suffered. We don't like this. They're out. And indeed, inflation happened under Ford, and he was uh, Ford and Nixon, and, and, and they were out, and Jimmy Carter was in. So inflation is something you pay a political price for. There's no way around it. Um, and it, again, it doesn't matter that inflation really, the cause of inflation started under Trump. It, it doesn't matter that Trump probably would have done the second um, stimulus package, which was inflationary, just the same as uh, Biden. It, none of that matters. It, it happened under Biden, and that's what counts. And, and the, the, the fact that people saw prices go up um, caused them to fear even more. Um, and, um, you know, I think that, I think that is really... Uh, that really enhanced the fear, the, skep the, 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 the pessimism, uh, the, the perception of a negative economy, uh, the perception that things are terrible. As I said, I, I don't think the economy is bad. I don't think things are terrible. I don't think any of the most negative stories about what's going on in the economy are true. I, don't, I think pe people's perceptions are wrong. And I think surprisingly and shockingly, they will change those perceptions on a dime once the leadership changes, you know, once the perception of the leadership changes, their perception of reality will change as well. Um, so uh, inflation in the 70s didn't really stop with Johnson, although Johnson's, Johnson didn't last very long either. It started in the 70s. And Johnson didn't even run in 68. Uh, so those are the two big reasons. There is a third reason. 
And, you know, I, I, I don't want to generalize here, but, but it, 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 it's a, it's, it, it, this is a tricky one to talk about, but I think, I think it is true. I, you know, part of the left's, part of the things that alienates people from the left is, the, is that it projects weakness, it projects softness, it projects, you know, a certain level of emotionalism, it projects a lack of masculinity. And, and maybe Waltz, the vice presidential candidate, is a good example of that. It's just not very strong, masculine. You know, it, it, it lacks that kind of self-confidence uh, that is physical often. And I think Trump, in a perverse way, and I think it is perverse, but it is true, in a perverse way, represents masculinity, a masculinity that I think a lot of men are looking for, and uh, whether they'll admit it or not. And it's also a masculinity that I think the Hispanic culture responds to, and I think a masculinity even black culture responds to. And I think that, that it's, a, it's, a, it's a certain aggression, it's a certain physicality, it's a certain presence. I think, I think you remember when he was shot and, and he got up and, and waved it in, and raised the fist. I think that had huge impact. At the time, I said Trump has won, um, just based on that, because I think that really resonates with a lot of people, with a lot of people. Um, I mean, there was a, as far as I can tell, there was a huge uh, female-male split here. Uh, almost in every age group, uh, with, with men overwhelmingly voting for Trump and, and women somewhat voting for Harris. And I think that is men relating to this masculinity issue. And I think that might explain some of the issue with the Hispanic population and why they have shifted so much towards Trump. Uh, I think they've, they've also uh, feel like they've taken an economic beating by inflation, so they, they're captured with everything else. They're no different than everybody else in that sense, but I also think there is this issue of, of, of Trump's perception, because I don't think it's a reality, perception of, mas of, 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 a, of a type of masculinity that people are responding, uh, are responding to. Um, all right, the last thing I wanted to say, and this relates to the Senate more than it does to the presidency, one of the interesting points is that, you know, a lot of Republican candidates did very well this cycle. Not only did they they flip well they they were expected to flip um, West Virginia but Montana they flipped they, they got a really good candidate a Navy Seal and and and, a, and somebody who who's a businessman is you know somebody who's really credible um, they um, uh, they flipped Ohio again this is the guy who lost to J D Vance but was more normal than J D Vance and that's why he lost in the primary two years ago and now he was up and he won the guy who might win in Pennsylvania, might win in Pennsylvania, is the guy who lost last time to Dr. Oz, was it? Dr. something? The, the crazy nutcase. Um, the Republicans fielded normal candidates in Wisconsin and Michigan. And the only crazy candidates, as far as I can tell, that Republicans fielded this round was Kerry Lake in Arizona. And it looks like Harry Lake in Arizona will lose, even though Trump will probably win Arizona. So I think the one lesson, but this was obvious, and this was obvious several cycles ago, um, and is that, is that, um, uh, when Republicans when Republicans put up candidates who are trying to be Trump but are not Trump, they lose. When they put up candidates that have many of Trump's ideas, many of Trump's ugliness, many of Trump's um, uh, you know, worst elements, they lose. Only Trump can get away with it. Only Trump has been able to create the package where he can say the stuff that he says, often completely crazy and nuts, and he can get away with it. Nobody else can. Carrie Lake was the last attempt, and she failed. I think J.D. Vance somehow managed to squeak through. Um, but other candidates, many candidates, particularly in the previous rounds in 2020 and 2022, could not and did not. So that the American people are willing to accept the nutty, crazy things that Trump says from Trump and seemingly from nobody else. 
And, uh, and, but, but, and this goes to my first point about the country not being democratic, right? Uh, not being on the left. But when Republicans field what I would consider normal candidates, candidates that stand up for normal, just the normal human beings, they, they, they're just not crazy, they win. They win. And, and, and they, they put up a good fight even when they lose, like in Wisconsin and in Michigan where the Democrats had a huge advantage in the Senate and yet the Republicans did okay. When they put up the wackos, they lose. They lose big. So, so much of the Trump phenomena is wrapped up with Trump and is about Trump. And it's about his particular form of ugliness. And I think the reason for that is that he is perceived to be, I don't think he is, but he's perceived to be a fighter. He's perceived to be standing up to the enemies. Um, you know, the fact that he's vulgar and the fact that he's often wrong when he stands up to enemies and, stand, and the fact that he doesn't stand for anything positive. He doesn't literally stand for anything positive. That is all brushed aside. Um, he, he does not stand, uh, well, I'm not going to repeat all the things I've said about Trump all the years. He does not stand for anything positive.